Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking through Luke's life of Christ, and we're continuing our study on the lovely figure in Luke, Simeon, uh, a wonderful man described as just and devout here. So let's read about Simeon. We already thought a little about him in the last lesson, but we'll have a little bit more this time. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, the gospel according to Luke 2, and we'll start at verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, we'll see in a further lesson what he said. But Simeon was this wonderful, believing man described as just and devout, uh, believing on the Lord Jesus by faith, uh, believing in Messiah. Uh, here he was going to find out it was Jesus. He didn't know him by that name previously, it seems, but he knew by the Holy Spirit he would meet the Messiah himself. And here he gets to meet the child Jesus and to prophesy, be among the first to physically recognize Messiah and hold him up and bless him uh, before the Lord and before the people that were gathered around in the temple. Now, this just man was described as devout. He had a real relationship with the Lord. And we noted last time he was waiting, not merely for a set of events, not kind of stoically hanging in there and saying, well, it's got to get better for us someday. The Bible says it will. But he was waiting for a person, the one called the consolation of Israel. And so this is a lovely messianic title because part of what the Lord Jesus came to be is the consoler, the great comforter, the one who can strengthen us, the one who can deliver us, the one who can encourage us, the one who saves us to the fullest extent possible. He's able to save to the uttermost the one who comes unto him. Now, Simeon knew these things about the Lord because he was, of course, closely associated with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was said to be upon him in verse 25. And dispensationally, Simeon pertained to the old era, the old dispensation of law, and in the Old Testament, we can see that the Spirit of God would come upon certain people, but he would even come upon people that uh, weren't being obedient to God or people that were unbelievers or people that were positively disobedient. Saul, uh, the king, Saul, son of Kish, the king in 1 Samuel, stands out probably as the preeminent example of someone who was disobedient and probably not even a believer in our understanding of the term, and yet someone whom the Holy Spirit would come upon betimes and use. Um, but uh, rather, Simeon was the sort of person who was a genuine believer, who had the Holy Spirit upon him, revealing certain things to him and showing him things that he otherwise naturally could not have known. Now, in the church age that we're presently in, anyone believing on the Lord Jesus Christ receives the Spirit of God. This is part of the gift of the gospel. This is what Joel chapter 3 had prophesied and what Acts chapter 2 shows us occurring. On the day of Pentecost, the risen Christ who had ascended up into glory gave the Holy Spirit, and the church was formed on that day. Acts 2 tells the tale. And of course, that new gift of God had to be authenticated and demonstrated in specific ways to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, and to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, and even to those who had received an incomplete gospel. They had believed the gospel of John the Baptist, the baptism unto repentance that he preached, but they hadn't heard about Jesus coming and dying and rising again from the dead and going back into heaven and now pouring out the Holy Spirit. They said, we have not even heard if there be a Holy Spirit. And so when Paul uh, prayed for them and taught them further, they received the Spirit of God in Acts 19. But since the end of that early period of the church, that foundational time of the apostles and the prophets, every believer 
receives the Spirit of God on belief in Christ. We're sealed with the Spirit unto the day of redemption, Ephesians 4 says. And is a wonderful part of the gospel. In fact, Romans 8 and 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then it's an indication that you're not truly a believer. Now, the Holy Spirit comes upon any believer today, and not just upon, but the real word for the church age is that the Holy Spirit indwells us, that he lives within us. John 14 speaks about him and the Father and the Son making their dwelling within us by the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who indwells the believer. But for Simeon, the Spirit was upon him. Now, we see something of the Holy Spirit's work that one thing that the Holy Spirit does is he reveals Christ to people. And John 16, the Lord Jesus told about when the Spirit came, he would do this. He would guide you into all truth, he says. So the apostles were going to learn things that the Lord hadn't taught them yet. It's true, John 14 says, he would bring the things to remembrance that the Lord had said unto them. So when they're articulating what the Lord had done and taught, we can have great confidence in that being the reality because the Spirit of God's the one who superintends that process. In other words, he's bringing it to their minds, making sure they remember and write down exactly what he wants to be preserved, what he wants to be revealed to us in the Scripture. And so this man had received a revelation from the Holy Spirit about the Christ. And he had been revealed, specifically had been revealed to him, verse 26, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So what a tremendous promise. Simeon, you're not going to die till you see the coming of Messiah. Now, I wonder if he had prayed for that specifically. The text doesn't tell us, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me because God-fearing Jews uh, from the Old Testament period over and over wanted Messiah to come, wanted to see these things. And First Peter chapter 1 refers to that. It even talks about the prophets who searched what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when he prophesied concerning the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So even the Old Testament prophets, as the Spirit of God revealed things through them and they wrote them down, and these became the oracles of God or the scriptures, the Bible, as we call it. They didn't fully understand who Messiah was going to be or when he would appear, and yet they longed to know about it. Daniel uh, asked the angel to tell him more in Daniel 12, and he's told to shut up the book and to seal it. So what wonderful days we live in when we have a completed Bible, when we have this great word of God, and we have the freedom to study it and to have the Holy Spirit to guide us if we're a believer in Christ, to teach us the word and to show us Christ in the word. And so this man, Simeon, had a privilege that generations of God-fearing Jews and maybe some Gentile proselytes as well had longed for to be able to see the consolation of Israel, to see that comforter with their own eyes, the great Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was coming to be prophet and priest and king and to be the savior of the world, but also to fulfill God's promises for Israel and through Israel to all the nations. And so the Spirit of God had revealed to him he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, we don't know if that's the case for us. You know, what we would say about his second coming and the rapture for the church. Am I going to be individually a believer who is alive and remains when the Lord comes? Or am I going to be one who would be described as the dead in Christ? And I simply don't know because the Lord does not tell us, uh, ordinarily at least, the day of our death. I mean, I don't know anyone that knows that. We know it's an appointment that we must keep, Hebrews 9.27, and as it is appointed once for a man to die, but after this the judgment. So we're going to die if the Lord doesn't come first. But we also know that the Lord said he's coming back to receive us to himself, and that it's going to be with that trump of God and that great assembling shout that he will call the believers up to meet him in the air. And that could be, of course, today. I'm recording this today, but you're watching it on another day because I record these things ahead of time. 
And by the time this recording goes up on YouTube, I could be in heaven with the Lord either by death or by rapture. The whole church could be there by rapture. And I would therefore be one who's alive and remain. And that when the Lord comes, I could say, wow, I'm being caught up as a living person. But if I die before he comes, as generations of believers have, it's been almost 2,000 years, and as the decades and the centuries and even the millennia have rolled along, the believers have prayed, even so come Lord Jesus. And it's been our longing expectation. We've been watching for the Lord to come. At least I hope we have. I hope you're watching, my friend. I hope you're not so buried in the minutia of life and the busyness of your schedule that you forget to look up and say, my redemption draws nigh. My Lord's going to come to redeem my body. The one who redeemed my soul and spirit also paid for my body. I belong to the Lord. I'm not my own. And he's going to come and catch me up to be with him forever. And this body is going to change. This mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruption will put on incorruptibility and will be in suitable form to be with the Lord forever. What a wonderful blessed hope believers have. The knowledge that the Lord is coming again. And even if we've died like many generations have, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're not going to miss out. That shout will call us out of the tombs, out of the graves. And century after century of saints some whose bodies have crumbled all the way to dust, the Lord will reconstitute them and transform them and make them into bodies of glory like his glorious body, suitable to be with him forever with the Lord. And we say, hallelujah, even so come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, as 1 Corinthians says. In any case, we look forward to that. We're looking for a person like Simeon was looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, of course, had revealed this to him, that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So you notice again, verse 27, so he came by the Spirit into the temple. And the Spirit of God doesn't lead us away from Christ. He leads us to Christ. And the mark of people filled with the Spirit is that they speak about Christ. So if you find someone who claims to be filled with God's Holy Spirit and they don't talk about the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that the Bible talks about him, their doctrine doesn't agree with what the Bible teaches. Their gospel isn't the same gospel. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we preached. Let him be anathema. That means accursed. And so it's a very serious matter because we live in days when a lot of people claim to be doing things by the Holy Spirit, but they're not things in keeping with the Word of God. They're not things that the Holy Spirit would sanction or that our Lord Jesus would approve of. No, the Holy Spirit leads us to Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Now we saw the parents in an earlier lesson bringing the Lord Jesus to the temple to present him before the Lord. There had to be the right sacrifice offered for purification. And you can read about this a little earlier in Luke 2, in verses 22 through 24. And of course, they were doing that in keeping with what the law said. Leviticus 12 taught this. And for a male child, like the Lord Jesus, uh, they had to come 40 days after he was born and present the right sacrifice and present him before the Lord. And so this is another example of the God-fearing obedience of Joseph and Mary. These were scriptural believers. These were believers who read and learned the Bible and put it into practice. They not only knew what the Bible said, but they obeyed what the Bible said. And that was a demonstration of the fact that they were real believers. So the timing here, think of it, that they're coming up at the time appointed by God. And that's the time that the Holy Spirit brings Simeon into the temple. And so there's no chance of them missing one another. There's this wonderful confluence of obedient, devout believers, of Joseph and Mary who are following the Lord devoutly, and Simeon also following the Lord, and all with this hope in Messiah, this faith in him, and this waiting for him to become the consolation of Israel. And so Simeon's response in verse 28 was he took him up in his arms and blessed God. 
And indeed, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it leads us to bless God, to talk about how good God is, to rejoice in God, and to be thankful toward God, to say, thank you, Father, for giving your son. Uh, Melody Green, I think it was, who wrote that song, There is a Redeemer. And the chorus says, thank you, O my Father, for giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. And so the Holy Spirit brings them all together to see Christ and to rejoice around him. In that sense, the child Jesus, just an infant at this point, but God incarnate, the Son of God, who was made flesh for us, who dwelt among us, tabernacled amongst us. He was there in the midst of them, right in the middle. And that's what we do today as believers. Believers meet around the Lord Jesus. That's what the meeting of the local church is all about. It's not meant to have Jesus on the sideline to do things that we appreciate and then at the end say, now let's pray and ask God to bless it. No, it's all about the Lord Jesus, all focused on him. Our worship is to ascend to him. Our praise is to be directed toward him. We are to lift him up in the word of God as we preach. We are to sing about him and be taken up with him. And so the Lord Jesus is seen in the midst here, and it's a wonderful picture of what we as believers are to do. I hope you're doing that today. I hope, like Joseph and Mary and Simeon, that you have a living relationship with God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit. I hope you really know him. And the way to know him, it's available to anyone. Anyone listening can turn from their sin and say, God, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I don't want to be the rebel that does the things against your word, that put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that held him there until he was accomplished, a modern hymn says. And I don't want to say uh, that I'll go on with that life. I don't want to stand against Jesus. I want to be loyal to him. I want to bow and say, my Lord and my God, save me a sinner. And I want to be his. I want him to have me born again. Now, the Lord says he'll give you the spirit. You will be born again by faith in Christ. And you'll be saved from the wrath to come, saved from hell and saved to heaven. And even now in this world, your walk with the Lord will begin and the Holy Spirit will lead you as you read the word and as you pray. You'll be led to Christ. You'll learn more of him and you will grow in him. May you come to him today if you never have. And if you do know him, again, spend much time in secret with Jesus alone, the hymn writer said. And that's very important to pray and read the word of God daily and many times of day to turn to our Lord and ask him to guide us and to trust in him with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. May God help all of us to do that. Thank you for listening.